because Kayla Ferguson and Addison Wedzik love Jesus, they want to say several scriptures and sing several songs. First of all, Psalm 100. Okay. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. And now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, heaven, holy is your name. May your kingdom come, come and, and your will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our, our daily bread, and but forgive us our, our debts as, as we forgive our debts. Who trespass us against us, us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For and thine then is, is the kingdom, kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 To the B I B L E. The B I B L E. That's, That's the book for me. me. I stand on the line on the word of God. The B I B L E. Would everybody sing it? B I B L E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. The B I B L E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B I B L E. Hallelujah. Okay. The God we serve is not dead. He is alive. Go, Kayla. Enjoy your life. He's in suffering. God's not dead. He sure your life. He's living inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead. Show sure your life. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. And God's not dead. Show sure your life. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. And God's not dead. Show sure your life. He's living on the inside, roaring like a lion. God's not dead. Sure you lie. He's living on the inside. Like a lion. God's not dead. Sure you lie. Hey, hallelujah. Thank you. Okay, now. And since it's Father's Day, we would like to pray the priestly blessing. And the girls haven't quite learned it yet, but we would like to say it to all the fathers and the congregation. Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus to bless all the fathers. We thank you for them, Lord. And we ask you to bless them, protect and keep them. Let your face shine upon them, Lord. Continue to be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance unto them, Lord, and give them your peace, your safety, your favor, O oh God. And we thank you, God. They have not been bought with corruptible things as silver and gold, but they've been bought with the precious blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you that through the blood of Jesus, they are 
redeemed out of the hands of the devil. All their sins are forgiven. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us continually from all sin. We've been justified, made holy, set apart to God. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, Satan has no place in us and no power over us. Through the blood of Jesus, we renounce him, loose ourselves from him, and command him to leave us in the name of Jesus. And we speak every vexing spirit, every harassing spirit, every tormenting spirit, every vexing spirit, every occult spirit, every infirm spirit. Loosen our bodies, loosen our minds, loosen our spirits. In the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we thank you for your precious Son, Jesus, and the precious Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Woo! Glory. Wow. Happy Father's Day, Dads. I, uh, working on this message here. I hope it blesses your fathers because I'm basically speaking to you today because it's, it's Father's Day. And, uh, Show of hands, how many fathers we got in here? Okay. Uh, Charles, could you put up Genesis 18, verse 17? Uh, King James, please. Okay. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him, for I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. Abraham was a father, and that's what we need to do as fathers. See that our children uh, come after us. And they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Now, you guys, you ever notice like on Mother's Day how we tell our moms how great they are? Every Mother's Day we tell our moms how great they are. We do that automatically. <laughs> becomes, uh, uh, but fathers, it's almost as if uh, uh, a father becomes great because we tell him to, or because moms tell him to. So uh, it's a number of descriptions that's given of a father. And some of them are, a father is a person who growls when he feels good and laughs very loud when he's scared. A father is a person who gets very angry when the school grades aren't as good as he thinks they should be. And a father is a person who hurries away from the breakfast table off to work. A father is a person who gives his daughter to a man who isn't nearly good enough so he can have grandchildren that are better than anybody else's. <laughs> so those are uh, some of the descriptions of a father. It, you know, I heard someone say, and, it's, and it's, it's believable, that a boy, he loves his mom, but he follows his dad. Now, that's believable. Now, think about that. There's a tremendous responsibility on being a father. A tremendous responsibility. A father, he has to lead his home. Tremendous responsibility. A father has to love his wife as Christ loved the church. Tremendous responsibility. A father is a real provider. Big responsibility. And as a provider, 
that charge for providing for his family. Now Paul says, if a man don't provide for his own, he is denied by the faith. And that's even worse than being an infidel. Now he told the Thessalonians that if a man would not work, neither should he eat. You know, my dad used to tell me that all the time. But he was trying to instill something in me. My dad was my legacy. And we're going to get to that too in a minute. But uh, my dad used to tell me that, and I really didn't know what he was talking about, you know, until I read it for myself. If a man don't work, he shouldn't eat. That's what a man's supposed to do. He's supposed to work. Think about it. Sin came into life that a man would earn his living by the sweat of his brow. And that's what we're supposed to do. Earn our living, provide for our families by the sweat of our brow. See, this turned work into a job, not into a joy, but it turned it into a, a job. But God gave us two things to allow us to turn that labor into a joy again. First, he gave us the privilege of providing for a family. It's a privilege for us men to provide for our family. God gave us that family to provide for them. As men, we are the leaders of the household. If we trust and believe in Jesus Christ. If you don't trust and believe in Jesus Christ, you are not the man of your household. If your, one, your wife is trusting and believing in Jesus and you are not, she's the man of your household, not you. Until you come to Christ and believe in what he did on the cross and trust in him, then you're the man of your household. Now, what is this privilege for us as men to provide for our household? Well, there's an uh, a inner need, a deep inner need in a man that makes him uh, feel complete when he does that. You're not complete until you provide for your household. But that inner need, that's something God built into us. Sometimes we push it to the side, but it's still there. He built that into us. It's like a homing pigeon. You can train a homing pigeon to go out and come back. But God built this into us. He's instilled this into men to provide for their families. Now, second, he gave us a new birth. What's a new birth? It's the presence of Jesus Christ living inside a man's heart. That's what changes us. That's what changes uh, work from being uh, wearisome to being wonderful. Now, that may stump some of you saying, work, wonderful? Yeah, yeah, you know, but that's what, that's what God is still in us. You know, and all I can say is, ain't God okay? Men, amen? amen. You know that means so be it. Maybe that's why the Lord tells us in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, please, through verse 30. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And part of that yoke and that burden is being a father. Come unto me, my yoke is easy. That means that the Lord not going to put 
no more on you than you can bear. He's not going to put you in a family situation if he knows you can't take care of it. Sometimes we put our own self in that family situation. That's why young people, when you're thinking about getting married, wait on the Lord. Let the Lord pick your husband. Let the Lord pick your wife. You'll know. Charles testified to that. He waited on the Lord for Rachel. When you wait upon the Lord, you're going to get what you're supposed to get. You're going to get somebody that you can love for the rest of your life. Pastor and Miss Susan waited upon the Lord. They've been together for over 60 years. That's a blessing, but it's a blessing from God. There's an old song that says, what you gonna do when the well runs dry? <laughs> and the retort to that song is, I'm gonna sit right down and cry. <laughs> you know. Fathers, I'm speaking to you guys, have you ever thought that your, your well had ran dry? I know I have. There's been a lot of times as a father that uh, I felt like that. I thought to myself, man, I'm in a dry place. My well done ran dry. What am I going to do? <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, where am I going to reach right now? And believe me, it's easy to sit down and cry, you know, but what do you do when you come to the end of your rope? What do you pull on? You're at the end of your rope. What do you pull on? Well, sometimes God forces us right here. Right here, down on our knees. Down on our knees so we can pray and get the answers from above. We don't have the answers. Never have, never will. Dad, you hear me? You don't have the answer. Only God has the answer. Sometimes we reach back for the word. And ain't nothing wrong with that. Reach back for the word. There was many times in my life that I had to reach back to legacy. That legacy I was talking about was my dad. I had to reach back to heritage. And I want to say that nobody in here had the privilege of knowing my father. But he was my legacy. It was the gift, he was the gift of heritage in my lifetime. I can't count the number of times that I had to reach back and pull a chunk of that legacy just to make it through one day. And all of us are busy. We are all busy with a multitude of things that we have to do. But let us not forget, men, that although we are investors in many things, we are also investors in that next generation. Those are our children. We are invested in them. We got to build a legacy for them so they can reach back. I used to think that a legacy when you die, it goes in the grave with that body. But no, it don't. It's still here. People reach back on that. I reach back on things that my dad told me years ago, like if a man don't work, he shouldn't eat. I reach back on that because it's true. That's why I don't mind going to work. Well, I'm retired now, thank God. But, you know, but we are building a legacy for someone else to draw upon. That's what we're doing as fathers. And I stand here today, this Father's Day, and I think of my father and how valuable his legacy has been to me. And what I would like to talk about you with the time that we have is about us being fathers who accept the joyous responsibility of building that legacy. Charles, would you put up Ephesians 6?
Okay. We, okay, we've been teaching our children this first three verses here. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Nothing wrong with that. It is right. Obey your parents and the Lord. Now, how many fathers have taught their children that? Show of hands. Okay. Now, as a whole, a lot of us have done that, but it says, children, obey your parents in the law, for it is right. Honor thy mother, thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Okay? That's it. We can shred the book, throw it away. That's it. That's all we need to know. But if we keep reading in verse 4, it says, and ye fathers. How many fathers are here this again? And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. In other words, we are to bring them up in the same environment that God would bring them up in. We are to produce a, a godly atmosphere for these little tender children. That's what we are to do as fathers. Or uh, let's call them tender plants because they are born to bear fruit just like we were. We need to face the fact this morning that as parents, we're going to build a legacy. The commitment I want you guys to see and I to come to today is not whether we build a legacy, because we will build a legacy. You hear me? We will build a legacy. But that's not the issue. Building a legacy is not the issue. The issue is, what kind of legacy will we build? Now, we have to understand that this command from God to us fathers shows both sides, and it shows both sides very clear. We are either build a legacy where anger is brought up alongside our children, which can destroy them, or we build a legacy of a child who was reared in the atmosphere of God. That's two sides. That's the choice. Not rather, not we build a legacy, but what can? Grandparents, grandfathers, grand, uh, grandparents, grandfathers, this applies to you and this applies to me because I'm a grandparent. I'm a grandfather. It applies to me as well. Now, there's a pattern for us to go through to build a godly legacy. The first thing that I want us to see is that there is a certain pattern for building this legacy. You see, in chapter uh, 6, verse 4, that puts a lot on my mind. That puts a lot on my mind. It should put a lot on you guys' mind, too. I don't know about you, but when I look back, one of the scariest things that I had to face in life was parenting. And the thing that I feel most guilty about a lot of times is parenting in my life because I didn't do it right. I made some mistakes. We all have starting out. Example, sometimes we may be having a service here and uh pastor may say, okay, today we're going to talk about family or it could be in the Sunday school class. We're going to talk about being a godly parent. Sometimes I used to think that he was talking directly to me. I'm, I'm being honest. I thought he was talking to me. 
I picked up condemnation because of some of the mistakes that I made. And when he would open up a subject like that, I would pick up condemnation. Why? Because I failed being a parent in many ways. Parenting is tough. It's tough. But now that I begin to read this book, I know better. And I do better. You ever heard somebody say, well, kids don't come with a manual? Sure you have. I know you have. I've said it myself. Some of y'all don't see it that. If you be, with, be honest with yourself, you said it. But I hate it when people say that now because I know better. You know what my answer is when people say that? Yes, they do. Here it is. This is it. Want to be a good parent? Read this book. It's all in there. Everything is in there. The Bible tells us to be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. In other words, be controlled by the Spirit of God. And I just want to remind us, fellas, that the first step in the pattern of the legacy is not what kind of parent you are, or what kind of parent I am, but what kind of person you are. You see, parenthood begins with personhood. There are some questions that your children may be asking. They're not asking, what did my dad do? They're not asking what kind of business is he in. They're not asking how big he is. Our children, I know that our children keep watching and asking what kind of person is this? Personhood. 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 The issues of life are not about our credentials. No. The issues of life are about our character. And you and I, no, and are you and I the kind of parents who have granted the spirit full run of our lives that he might do as he wants to do? And I'm talking about the Holy Spirit here. Is there no issue that we keep from the Holy Spirit? There may be something going on that we try to keep from the Holy Spirit. You can't keep nothing from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can't keep nothing from the Holy Spirit. God knows everything. He created everything. Is the Holy Spirit in absolute control in our life? Men? We have to, as pastors say, we have to read ourselves. And see if the Holy Spirit has got absolute control in our life. Or do we take our signals from some other place? If the Holy Spirit ain't ruling your life, somebody else is. Personhood is the first and most vital issue. And believe me, if we can't skip, we can't skip from personhood to parenthood. It don't work like that. Because the text don't start with parenthood and then say be a spirit controlled person. No. The very first application your personhood is where uh, the very first application of your personhood is where? It's in a partnership. Now, when I say partnership, I'm talking about your spouse. You got to have a partnership with your spouse, and y'all work together. Don't get a partnership with 
everything going to be out of whack. You can't take it up on yourself to do it this way, and she take it up on herself to do it that way. You know, because if you pushing, and she pulling, and y'all going in different directions, it ain't going to work. But if she's pushing, and you pulling, and y'all going in the same direction, everything going to work out fine. For those of us fathers who have not passed, got past that text in the Bible where it says, wives submit, then that following text is very, very important. It says, husband, love your wife. Love your wife. That's one of the greatest needs in a child's life is to see how dad's treating mom. And believe me, children are watching. They're watching how dad's treating mom. Because children, uh, at a young age, they are very, very impressionable. And things that get in that little brain, they stay in there. They just don't go out. So they're watching how you treat mom. Th that's what their whole security is wrapped up tight in that partnership between mom and dad. Their whole security is involved in that, in that relationship with the two. You see, the first thing in a legacy is personhood, and we pour that personhood into our partnership by loving our wives. There are two models. Now, this is important. Paul said, love your wife as Christ loved the church, as Christ loved the church. You know what that means? Okay, we, we're going to use some words here. We're going to play on some words. It means with sacrifice. It means with meeting her needs. Sometimes it means sacrificing your own dreams. <laughs> it means giving up our time. Okay, what about the word sensitivity? Being sensitive to her needs. Being sensitive to her needs. Boy, it's getting good up in here, ain't it? <laughs> okay, okay, let's use the word unconditionally. That means that even when she rides through the window on a broom. <laughs> Y'all caught it. That's just a joke. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> That's a joke, fellas. Even so, if she does, the commitment to your personhood being poured into that partnership is still there. No matter how she acts. That commitment is still there. Y'all get my point? Let me tell you something. Now, my love for my wife wasn't conditioned on her. It was the, the outgrowth of the spirit control over me when it came to her. Why do you love your wife? Dads? Is it because she desires it? Boy, if you do, that's going to be a yo-yo experience. <laughs> no, you love your wife because the personhood demands that we do what God has told us to do. Love your wife. Not because she desires it, and every woman desires to be loved by her husband. I haven't seen a woman or yet that didn't desire to be loved by her husband. But you do it not because she desires it, but because God told you to do. See, God takes precedence right there. He takes precedence. I told you to do this. 
do it. Unselfishly, we have to do it. That's the only way a relationship is going to work for 60 years. We have to do it. And we love our wives like Christ loves the church, right, men? Amen? So be it. Now, God knows how uh, thick we can be sometimes as men. So he gave us two examples. And I'm paraphrasing. I'm paraphrasing here. He said, if you don't come to grips with that loving your wife as Christ loved the church, then do it anyway, the way you love yourself. So how do you love yourself? You might say, I don't love myself. I have a terrible image. You might say, in fact, I've been undergoing counseling for months to help me fix up this terrible image that I have. That's how much you love yourself? I never met a person that didn't love themselves. That's why God said you had to love your wife as you love yourself. So I ask you again, how do you love yourself? And this time you say, I love myself tenderly. I love myself eagerly. When I have a need, I meet it just like that. That's how you love your wife. Amen? So be it. And that's how we meet our wives' needs. We meet them tenderly. We meet them eagerly. The way we love ourselves. And then we commit to personhood. And by flowing our personhood to partnership, then that partnership tackles that scary responsibility. And that scary responsibility is called childhood or parenthood. Now, we are in chapter 6, verse 4, and he says, fathers, this is step three in the process to be a godly parent. Provoke not your children to wrath. Our children expect a lot from us as fathers. A lot. They come into this world with all kind of expectations. And guess what? Nobody's got to teach them to teach them that. They come into this world already equipped with that. But then suddenly, they reach out for dad. Oh, dad's got my needs. And they find out that dad's not there. They find out that dad is distant. They find out that dad don't even care. This is probably the first time that that child is going to feel disappointment. That child is going to feel disappointment. Now, if that disappointment continues to materialize itself, here comes discouragement. And then anger is going to crouch up in that child's life. I'm speaking truth here. So the best thing for us to do as fathers, for us is to learn how to not bring anger up alongside our children. If we're going to build a godly legacy. You know, I've had a, a pretty good military career. 22 years in the Navy. And I've held some very important positions. I've done some very important work. I've met some very important people. A few of those folks I can call friends. I've gone to a lot of important places. 
But I found out that my children, they weren't impressed with that. They weren't impressed with who I am or where I go or what kind of business card I got in my pocket. They weren't impressed with that. You was not either. You know what it would impress my children the most or my grandchildren? The way I would sit down and do something with them. Give you a good example. Rick called me last Wednesday. Rick said he wasn't going to be here because his grandboys had some awards that they was going to be presented, and I want to be there. Would you take over for me? I said, gladly. That's what I'm talking about. That's a grandparent. Those ain't his kids, but he wanted to be there. Those, that's what those children are looking for. Somebody that's going to be in their corner. Their dad is there. Their grandfather is there. Don't you think that'd make that kid's self-esteem just shoot sky high? Amen. That's what I'm talking about. We have to be there for our children. I woke up to the fact a little bit late in life that my children was just impressed with one thing for me, my time and my attention. Period. That's it. That's all they wanted was my time and my attention. We have to be there for our kids. That's what they expect. They expect that daddy is, is God's gift for them. They expect that daddy, God put daddy in my life to love me, to nurture me. To raise me up in a godly atmosphere. That's what they expect. And that's what we got to do as fathers. Amen. Children can be selfish too. But they ought to be. They ought to be selfish. Looking back, I tell you what discouraged my children and grandchildren. They got discouraged a lot of times when I was too busy too busy, or when I was too serious, or when I was too big for them, or when I was too bitter, or when I was too bothered. Mm. Mm. That's what can set a cancer free in your legacy, that you're trying to build a godly legacy. That's what can set cancer free in it. How many times my son has come to me and said, Daddy, Let's play basketball. Or let's go do this. Or let's go do that. What was my answer? I'm too busy. I remember one time I came home from work and um, I said to my son, Come on, son, let's go play some basketball. You know what he told me? Not now, Dad, I'm too busy. I'm too busy. Nice times like that that I had to reach back for that legacy that was put forth for me. You see, my dad was a workaholic. My dad was a superintendent for a, a large construction company. And I remember times when uh, my dad could get away from work 
and I may need some help with my bike or whatever. My dad would put his work clothes on and he'd take that time with me. I appreciated that because my dad was helping me. My dad was showing me. He was guiding me. But most of all, he was spending time with me. And how many times have I had to reach back, just thinking about those times, from that legacy, and remember that my dad took the time with me. Why can't I do it with my kids? But I'll tell you what, God is using me today to tell you fathers, spend some time with your children. Don't be too busy. What kind of legacy are you building? How many times have I reached back? You know, we get caught up thinking that uh, our importance in our kids' life is just paying the bills or buying the groceries to put on the table, putting shoes on their feet, all that's good. That's all important. But the time we spend as fathers with our children and our grandchildren, that's important as well. You know what I love about my father in heaven? You might say that I don't have much of a legacy. You may be saying that, that may be running through your mind. But you do in heaven. Because our father in heaven, he provides that legacy for us. You can call your son, your daughter, or your grandchild on the phone and say hello whatever, to whatever their names are. This is your earthly father. And I'm sure that those kids appreciate that. Our father in heaven, he didn't stand up and say, look, I'm the almighty God, the great Jehovah, El Shaddai. Come up to this world. If you think, if you want to make it, come on up here to this world. No, he didn't say that. Our father in heaven climbed right down here in our world. The world he created, he walked into it and came right on down here with us. He met us right here where we are. That's what we have to do with our kids, meet them where they are. Amen. And our Heavenly Father, he takes us by, his, by our hands and he walks us through every season, every stage until he finally and ultimately lifts us up to his world forever. What a legacy that is. Now, if God the Father, if he's not too big for me, and if he climbs into my world and meets me where I am, must I not do the same thing for my children? Must you not do the same thing for your children? So I challenge you this morning, dads. Take your children by the hand and slowly play with your kids. Walk them all the way through each season till they grow up into their own world and carry that, own, that legacy with them. We need to loosen that vice that we got on our kids. Sometimes I believe we think that our whole reputation rides on how good our children are. Well, if anybody in here is feeling that way, stop it and concentrate on how good of a dad you are. Guess what? That's all about, that's about the only control that you got anyway. 
is yourself. You can't control that kid. You can't. God didn't give you that child to control that child. He gave you that child to nurture that child. He gave you that child to bring that child up in a godly atmosphere. And that, that's our responsibility. That's our responsibility. Too many moms are taking the lead. That's our responsibility. So, we need to know when not to get up tight. And then we need to know when to get up tight. But we need to never take this attitude, I'm too busy. Never take that attitude, I'm too busy. One thing we know about our Lord, he ain't never too busy. Never too busy. That's what the Lord is like. And that's what it's like to raise somebody like the Lord would. We have to raise our kids like the Lord would. And it's all right here. Our God, never too busy, he's never too serious. If he was too serious, he done got rid of me a long time ago. If he was too serious. He comes to our world and meet us right where we are. Our Lord is never too bothered. Legacy, legacy, legacy. I've been reaching back a lot lately, drawing on that legacy, drawing on that legacy. And I thank God for my earthly parents who built a legacy for my life. When my well is dry, I'll reach back. I may find a memory, but I'll reach back to that memory. I thank God for a father who was somewhat like God to me, a, a godly figure to me. Fathers, we are busy. Yeah, we're busy. But we don't, be, don't need to be too busy to build a legacy. And it starts with what kind of person you are. Pour it into what kind of parent you are. Given as a parent to your children. So I challenge you today. Build that legacy. Stop waiting on your wife to do it. It's your job as a father, as a man, as a man of God. Build that legacy. Let's pray. With all heads bowed and every eye closed. Father, we pray by your spirit that you would help us because we need your help, Father. We need your help in every way. Father, sometimes we get so caught up, we get turned up, we get turned inside out, and our priorities are rearranged, pride standing up and getting in the way, and we need your help, Father. Father, help us to build for the next generation and parent for a productive future and grant our children the greatest gift that we can give them, the legacy of our Father in heaven. Because future generations are going to reap what we sow, Father. And Father, may the shield of faith continue to be a place of welcome, a source of healing, and a house of God that keeps our faith alive. Father, we ask that you pick us up when we fall. And Father, we ask that you show us how to comfort others, especially our children. And Father, steer us in the direction that you lead, not the direction that we lead. Steer us in the direction that you want us to go, not in the direction that we want to go. Guide us as we walk in your footsteps, Father, in creating a legacy of faith in loving service to you. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.